It's good to be back in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. I am excited today. Uh, as you may or may not have seen uh, on Facebook, but I announced uh, a new sermon series called Cornerstones of Faith. And uh, I am, I've been working on it for several, several weeks, and I'm just excited as I can be. You're going to find that there are several P's uh, that you're going to be able to add to your faith that are going to really, really make a difference in your life and how you minister to everybody else. You know, in early architecture, there were cornerstones in buildings. They were blocks of stone that were used to start the groundwork and the under underpinning of a new building. Without these solid cornerstones properly placed, the foundation and the structure built on that foundation would be unstable, insecure, unreliable, and probably unsafe. So as I begin this new series of messages entitled Cornerstones of Faith, I want you to realize that throughout this series, you're going to find aspects of Christian behavior that will enable you to make a positive difference in the world around you. When these important Christian qualities are intentionally developed and intentionally nurtured, you can make an effective difference for your Lord Jesus Christ and bring glory to God. Sometimes I think it's important for us to shore up our foundation. Amen? Sometimes we go through life and we need to realize that there are certain things we might need to relearn. We might need to shore up that foundation so that we keep these cornerstones in place. So the first cornerstone is the cornerstone of practice. Practice. How we practice our faith directly impacts how reliable it's going to be, directly impacts how effective your Christian life is going to be. You see, when a person truly comes to Jesus Christ, that relationship will dramatically transform his or her life. You've heard me say it before. What Jesus changes, Jesus, or what Jesus saves, Jesus changes. If you don't see changes in your life, then you very well ought to question whether there has been a salvation experience. Here's the point I'm trying to make. When you're truly converted, when you're truly born again, saved, redeemed, reconciled to God, however you want to put it, a transformation in your life becomes obvious. And people will see it in how you live. The Bible calls these results these results of our commitment to Jesus, the Bible calls it bearing fruit. If we don't bear fruit, obviously we have not had or established a relationship with Jesus. We have not come to know Him as both Savior and Lord. And why is that? That's because the natural results of a person coming into a reunion with God is, listen up, change. That's the natural result when a human being comes into a reunion with God. So, that being said, bearing fruit in the life of a Christian is not an option. Listen to how the Apostle Paul put it in Romans chapter 7 and verse 4. He said, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, here we go, that we should bear fruit 
to God. When you get married to Jesus, amen, the natural result is you start bearing fruit to God. Now, sadly, there are some religions, even some denominations, that confuse this area of fruit bearing. They confuse this area of practicing our faith. So today, I want you to begin seeing what the Bible says. Not what Brother Bill says. Not what a Baptist church says. I want you to see what the Bible says about this issue of bearing fruit. Because the Bible gives us today four principles. Four principles that believers ought to flesh out, if you will. Flesh out in order to start learning how to practice our faith. The first principle is this. We show that God is at work in us. The believer, the Christian, the born-again child of God shows that God is at work in them. Your life should show that God is making changes in you. Your life should show that God is transforming you, maybe ever so slowly, but transforming you into the beautiful image of Jesus Christ. Now, how does that happen? How is it that people begin to see this transformation that's occurring in you? Here it comes. Through outward actions. That's how they see it. Now, we all know that while on this side of heaven, we will always struggle with the desire on one hand to obey God and the desire on the other hand to follow our own sinful instincts. That's a constant war that we're waging. It's a constant battle that we're fighting. Even the great apostle Paul knew what it was like to struggle with sin. In Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8, he reveals to you and I six keys that we need to win the battle against sin. To win the battle against this struggle against sin. But when we do so, it not only pleases God, but it also, get this, it shows others that God is at work in us. So if you would, follow along with me in your Bibles. I'm going to begin in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, where Paul is writing to Christians, a church not unlike ourselves, and here's what he says. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, I'm fleshly, sold under sin. Listen to what he says. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not, here it comes, practice. What I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that's what I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, Nothing good dwells, for to will is present within me, but how to perform or how to practice what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that is what I practice. Are you hearing the conflict in Paul's voice here? He goes on in verse 20. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law that's evil Present, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see that other law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Listen to what Paul says. O oh, wretched man am I! Who will deliver me from this body of death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind 
I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak in the flesh, God did. God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, listen up y'all, set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, to be fleshly minded, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life, and get this, and peace. Wow. Wow. There's some good keys here for you and I to learn about how to overcome sin in our life. Is there anybody else besides me that has sin in their life? Good deal. We're all in agreement. Here's the first key to winning that battle against sin. Number one, admit the power of sin in your life. Did you hear what Paul said in verse 14? For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. But for what I will to do, that I don't practice. What I hate, I do. You see, to be an overcomer, friend, to be an overcomer with this struggle with sin, you've got to first recognize that you have this self-destructive nature within you. We all do. Every human being after Adam and Eve was born with this vulnerability to the enticements of sin. And if you fail to see your potential weakness, you will be even more vulnerable to the destructive power of sin in your life. Listen to what Paul says. He says you better not have a, an attitude that says, oh, that could never happen to me. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, he says, if you think you're standing strong now, you better not be too arrogant because you could fall too. No matter who you are, no matter where you are in your spiritual growth, you need to be very aware of the power of sin in your life. Now there's a second key. Second key for victory over your sinful instincts. And that is, realize that you are powerless to change on your own. Listen to what he said in verse 18. For I know that in me, my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present within me. But how to perform, how to practice what is good, I do not find. Your inherited sinful nature is the source of your problem. It's almost not your fault because you inherited that sinful nature and that is the source of your problem. And so therefore you will never master sin. You will never live a life that's pleasing to God on your own. You're going to need some help. You're going to need some divine help. And Jesus taught us that apart from God, you can't do anything. You remember what he said in John 15? He said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, here we go, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. You can't do it on your own. But listen to the third key to overcoming our sinful instincts. That is, you got to become fed up. Look at me, y'all. we got to become fed up. Become fed up to the point where you cry out to God. Saying, I can't do this, Lord.
Lord, I need your help. Look at what Paul said in verse 24. Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? We as Christians can't do it. We can't control evil in our life simply because we're determined to do so. No, you've got to come to the end of yourself. Come to the end of yourself and begin to cry out asking God for help over your sin battles. Can I ask you a question this morning? What sin are you fed up with this morning? What sin in your life have you had it up to here with in your life? That's where you got to come. You got to get fed up and cry out for help. But there's a fourth key. Fourth key to overcoming these sinful instincts, and that is you've got to accept your freedom. Look at verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. How foolish would it be for you to cry out to Jesus for help? Oh, I can't do it, Lord. I'm crying out to you for help. But then when he reaches down, you say, no, Lord, I got this. That's what we do. That's exactly what we do. Friends, we have got to take the hand of help that's offered to us by Jesus. We have got to accept the help that Jesus gives us to remove the shackles of sin. We've got to accept the help to break these generational curses in our life. We've got to accept the help from Jesus to realize that you no longer have to sin. You don't have to. You've been freed from that sin. Let me give you a fifth key to overcoming your sinful instincts, your inherited sinful instincts, and that is to receive God's forgiveness and His lack of condemnation. You see, when a believer in Christ truly acknowledges his or her sin and truly turns away from his or her failures, struggles, and broken commitments, God will forgive. And God will not Condemn. Listen to what Paul said in chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. Are you hearing me, church? Made me free from the law of sin and the law of death. Receive His forgiveness. The last key that we need to know uh, from this passage about uh, overcoming our sinful instincts is we've got to remove instinctive actions of our sinful nature. See, the only way to stop sinful actions is to stop living by your sinful nature. you got to stop living by your sinful nature and start living by the power of the Holy Spirit. But how do we do that? How do I stop living by my sinful nature and start living in the power of the Holy Spirit? I believe that Paul addresses it in verse 5 of chapter 8. Take a look. He says, For those who live according to the flesh, according to their inherited sinful nature, set their minds on things of the flesh. That's all they think about is what the body wants, what they want, what I want. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. It's when we yield our minds to the Spirit that you can find yourself controlled by the Spirit, then you begin thinking about things that please the Spirit. I just got to tell you this morning, the mind, Janet and I were talking about this this last week, the mind is the battlefield. That gray matter between your ears is where the battle begins. This is the battlefield. 
And where your mind is, is a matter of life or death. Look at what Paul said in verse 6. For to be carnally minded, to be fleshly minded, to be constantly focused on what the flesh wants and what the individual wants is death, Paul said. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. How many of you like a little bit more peace in your life? Amen? I mean, we all, I believe that that is the, that is the base, basic foundational uh, trait that we would all love to have more of in our life. Well, Paul tells you how to have it right there. Become more spiritually minded and you'll have life and peace. But to do that, you're going to have to cut off those instinctive actions and relinquish control of your mind to the Spirit of God. What do you find yourself thinking about day in and day out? Are you thinking about things of, of God? Or are you thinking about things that you want? Are you thinking about things of the Spirit? Or are you thinking about things of the flesh? That's where it all starts. is in the mind. Now I'm fully aware that while we're on this side of heaven, every one of us here have the potential to sin. We all have it. But when you begin to draw on the power of God, when you begin to yield your thought life to the Spirit of God, then you come to the place where you can walk in faith and show, show that God is working in you. That's an important principle. That's what believers do. They show to other people that God is at work with in them. But there's a second biblical principle that we must learn to be effective as we practice our faith. And that is we focus on living out our faith. Living out what we believe. Listen, you don't need to change your lifestyle before you come to Jesus. Everybody knows that, right? You ain't got to change before you come to Jesus. But listen here, once you do... Once you do come to Jesus, you will experience change. You will experience change in your priority. You will experience change in your relationships with others. You will experience change in your walk with God. And if you don't see those changes, friend, then you could probably doubt that Christ is even coming to your life. Here's the nuts and bolts of it all. The way you live should reflect what you believe. The way you live through the good times and the bad, through the tragedies and the crisis and the mountaintop experiences, the way you live should reflect what you believe. Does it? Here's the way John the Baptist put it. In Luke chapter 3, verse 8, he said, you ought to bear fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, you ought to prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and you've turned to God. Now, James brings up another excellent reason why we ought to back up our faith with outward actions. Listen to what the half-brother of the Lord Jesus said in James chapter 2. He said, what does it profit, my brothers? In other words, what difference does it make to you? What good is it if someone says he has faith but does not have works? What if he says he has faith but he don't practice? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, I'll pray for you, brother. But you don't give him the things that are needed for the body. What is it, prophet? What good is that? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. 
Faith by itself, if it does not have practice, are you hearing me, church? If it does not have practice, ain't real. If it's just words coming out of your mouth, but it's not being manifest in your life, listen to me carefully, y'all. It's not real. If your faith doesn't have practice, it's counterfeit. It's fake. It's not real. They go hand in hand. Outward actions. Would you agree with me that outward actions really make it easier for us to share our faith? People look at you and they see your outward actions of faith and they say, man, she's really got it going on. She's really close with the Lord. Look what she does in the name of Jesus. Right? I mean, think about these for instance. Sharing your redemption story. Sharing your redemption story is an outward action of faith. Can I ask some of you, what are you waiting on? What a wonderful opportunity to have an outward action of faith by just telling your three-minute story. What about this one? Sharing our services on social media. I believe that is an outward action of faith. In fact, if I wasn't already online, if I wasn't already on Facebook, if I already didn't have access to YouTube, that's something I would invest in. For one reason and one reason only. So that I could produce these outward actions of faith and share our services and share these redemption stories of other people. They're outward actions of faith. And it does require an investment. You see, when people see that you genuinely care about their eternity, then they're going to be much more apt to listen to the Jesus that you serve. Can people hear Jesus in what you share? Can people see Jesus in the way you live? If not, listen up carefully. If they can't see it, if they're not hearing it, then it's time for you to move out of the way and let Jesus into the driver's seat. Because he ain't there. Now I know that we may not do it perfect every time. I know that we may not live according to our faith every single time. But I believe that we as believers ought to strive to practice our faith every time. And that all gets back to our thought life. Always thinking about how I can practice my faith. Let me give you a third quick Bible principle that believers ought to flesh out as we learn to practice our faith. And that is, we realize that God has saved us for a purpose. When you were an unbeliever, you really didn't have much to motivate you to live right. You may have searched for purpose. You may have searched for meaning in your life and you come up empty. There was just nothing that was really satisfying in your life. But as a believer, y'all, as a believer, you are God's masterpiece. Which means that His Spirit is alive in you and is working in your life to make you more like His Son, Jesus. The Bible says it this way in Ephesians 2.10. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Here it comes. You ready? For good works. For good practice. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, that describes part of why you're here. That one verse describes part of your purpose that God has for your life. And that is to practice Faith works in your life to do good works by helping other people. Does it amaze you that God had plans for your life long before you even existed? Generations before you were even born, God began to plan out days and events in your life. He began to think about how he was going to use you for his glory. He began to think about opportunities that he was going to provide for you to share your faith with other people. So listen up, y'all. 
The next time that you see a neighbor in trouble, the next time that you hear about a friend that's struggling, the next time that you notice a co-worker in distress, the next time that you see a stranger who desperately needs a helping hand, the next time you are offered an opportunity to share your redemption story, take hold of that opportunity that God preordained for you generations ago. It's for you. It's for you. He said, let your light shine before men that you may glorify your Father in heaven. How do you do it? Let your light shine so that they may see your good works, so that they may see your outward actions of faith, so that they may see you practicing your faith and glorify your Father in heaven. So if we're going to effectively practice our faith, then we need to shore up that cornerstone of practice. We need to shore up the foundation so that that cornerstone of practice doesn't get out of whack. To do it, you're going to have to show on a daily basis that God isn't working you. You need to focus on living out your faith. We also need to realize that you were saved for a purpose. The divine purpose of God. One last one before we close. The last biblical principle that we're to flesh out as we learn to practice our faith. And that is, we better make sure that our walk matches our talk. We better make sure that our walk matches our talk. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does, he who practices the will of my Father in heaven. Your walk better match your talk, my friend. That is one of the cornerstones of your Christianity, is making your walk match your talk. In that last verse there, Jesus gets right to the heart of, of what you really believe. He gets right to the heart to what you really believe. He clearly states that merely calling Him Lord ain't enough to get you into heaven. Anybody could call Him Lord and not mean it. So it must be more than that. And I believe that what counts in the economy of God is a salvation experience that causes a changed person to love and to live in obedience to the Father's will. To practice the will of our Father in heaven. You may be able to say all the right things, but if your faith does not impact the way you live, it is meaningless. You may be able to talk a big game, but if it doesn't flesh out, it's not real. And get this, it's probably offensive to God. You can talk a good game, but if you refuse to get off the bleachers in real life, you probably don't have a real relationship with God. Why? Because when we have a real relationship with God, the more we learn about what He's done for us, the more we want to know how we can live for Him in a way that honors Him. Listen, y'all, God is looking for some genuine believers. God is looking for some real deals, some real Christians out there who are willing to practice their faith. And that's why practice is a cornerstone of our faith. Are you a genuine believer? Do you want to be a genuine believer? The Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Here it comes. In Christ Jesus. Without Him, you can't do anything. Without Him, you can do nothing. So I don't want you to be deluded in these days 
In these days that I believe where the close of humanity is close. I don't want you to be deceived because I believe that Jesus is coming and I believe He's coming very soon. And who and what you believe and therefore do will determine where you will spend eternity. Are you a genuine believer? Do you want to be one? Before you walk out of this building, you can be. I just want to invite you to come during this invitation time. And I'll show you exactly what the scriptures say about how to become a genuine believer. Let's pray together. Thank you.